early city streets were paved, and these were still dominated by pedestrians, horses, and trolley cars. Once outside the city, automobiles were on their own. This meant that early cars had to be able to go anywhere. And go anywhere they did, or at least they tried. From picnic afternoons to cross-country treks for more adventurous drivers. Daily excursions often meant a trip to the bottom of the nearest mud hole. I guess we don't realize what it was like because of the way we look at everything today and everything's so accessible, but back then there were very few public roads and, and they were no more than horse-drawn horse carriage trails in the area and all over the country, really. I think you really, in the early days, had to be an absolutely adventurous spirit possibly even more so than the people that four-wheel today. Um, until the mid to late 1920s, there weren't particularly good or extensive road system in the country, um, not a lot of services. You basically had to know how to handle your vehicle, how to repair your vehicle. Um, it was an adventure. Although it did its best, the car had its limitations. With only two wheels providing power, slippery roads, mud, snow, and hills were a problem. At the turn of the century, when cars uh, were invented, there weren't really roads. There were two ruts that wagons had been pulled over, and when you tried to drive a mechanical vehicle over there with very thin wheels, you didn't have any traction, and a two-wheel drive was, was uh, very limited in what you could actually do with it. Uh, hence the need for a four-wheel drive system. As early as 1899, automotive pioneer Robert E. Twyford of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, was employing a primitive four-wheel drive system on a variety of cars. Others followed with their own designs, but the idea remained little more than a novelty. Yeah, there was a lot of experimentation. Uh, I've heard people say that there were up to 35 different people and uh, companies working on developing automo automobiles and uh, four-wheel drive systems, uh, something to replace the horse and the carriage. It wasn't until 1906 that the first commercially viable four-wheel drive vehicle hit the muddy roads of North America. That year, the duplex power car company of Charlotte, Michigan, developed the Model B a 14-horsepower, two-cylinder, four-wheel drive truck. But the real breakthrough in four-wheel drive motoring came in 1908, when two Wisconsin machinists, Otto Zakow and William Besserdick, built their first steam-powered 4x4. They were pretty much the uh, people, everybody brought things to in town to fix, repair, or uh, kind of change, you know, and, and it seems like they were always interested in advancement or trying to improve things. And that was basically what, what uh, the four-wheel drive concept stemmed from, is, is their uh, inventive nature and, and just trying to figure how to make something work better. The car broke new ground with the first steerable integrated front driving axle in America. The following year, Zakow and Besserdick replaced the steam engine with a gas-powered 45 horsepower four-cylinder power plant. They attached a red body to the chassis and dubbed the car the Battleship. They vigorously tested the vehicle. The design proved to be battle-ready and they formed the Badger Four-Wheel Drive Company and tried to sell their all-weather, all-road car. Results were mixed. Initially, four-wheel drive just about doubled the cost of the vehicle. So uh, you had the choice of spending almost twice as much or getting stuck. And for, for some people, it was a lot cheaper to get stuck than it was to buy four-wheel drive. And that did slow the development of four-wheel drive more than anything. In 1910, Walter A. Olin took over the struggling company and changed the name to the Four-Wheel Drive Company, later shortened to FWD. Until W.A. Olin came along, it was just another idea or an invention in a blacksmith shop that, that somebody was playing with. Olin
Cleveland was so sure of his car that he offered a $1,000 prize to any vehicle that could follow the battleship cross-country for 15 minutes. Hundreds of cars accepted the challenge, but no one ever collected the prize. Although the car had proved itself structurally, the battleship still didn't find a market with motorists. And only seven were produced. There wasn't a lot of wealth in this area. There were a lot of uh, um, farmers and loggers, uh, not a lot of wealthy people. And it was at that time considered to be uh, not a necessity, but a luxury. And a, a relatively expensive luxury for that time. They were very good cars, but people just didn't have the money to spend. And, and in the end, they discovered that uh, the truck market was booming. And the all-wheel drive truck market was, uh, was virtually untapped. At the vanguard of the burgeoning truck market was the U.S. Army which began to experiment with trucks for military operations. In 1911, a cross-country test was scheduled to see if, indeed, motorized vehicles could replace horses. FWD's entry, a stripped-down battleship, was the only vehicle employing four-wheel drive, which gave it a leg up on the other three trucks in the 1,500-mile test. It was even called upon to pull the competition out of the mud. So by the time that test was over, everybody was pretty convinced that a four-wheel drive was in the best interest of the Army because it could handle terrain that, that nothing else could. Even though four-wheel drive had proven it could meet the demanding needs of the military, it took several years for the government to call upon the tough trucks for active duty. Initially, the Army didn't get too involved with FWD. It wasn't until about 1916 that they started buying FWD Model B trucks in large numbers. And that was mostly for in 1916, when Pancho Villa started raiding across the border in, in uh, the southwest, uh, they sent uh, General John Blackjack Pershing to uh, chase down Pancho Villa, and they decided that they were going to make this a motorized campaign. And it was the first actual test of motor trucks and four-wheel drive trucks in an actual military campaign. By the time World War I broke out in Europe, Four-wheel and two-wheel drive trucks were widely accepted as troop transport vehicles and ambulances. It was clear that a mechanized army could travel much farther and much faster and over much more treacherous terrain than ever before. By 1940, with the introduction of the Dodge VC, the government was ready to completely transform the army into a modern, mobile fighting machine and say goodbye to the horse forever. The Army, between World War I and World War II, recognized that the horse was becoming an outdated mode of transportation. Uh, a a four-wheeled vehicle, a four-wheel drive vehicle, could adapt to different varieties, uh, different situations. It could hold more people, it could carry more ammo. It didn't get tired, it didn't get sick, so to speak. The VC series was offered in a command car, a pickup, and a carry-all body style. These rugged transport vehicles could go anywhere, but were not small or agile enough to be used in combat. When Hitler's Blitzkrieg of Poland began in 1939, the face of warfare changed forever. It was easy to see how valuable a more nimble, go-anywhere vehicle could be in the struggle to defeat the Germans. All of Europe was scrambling to stay ahead of the advancing German army. Meanwhile, in the United States, a project was underway to develop a tough, fast, all-terrain vehicle that could outrun and outshoot the Nazis. The result would forever change the course of modern warfare and change the course of history. The Kubel Wagon, developed from the 1930s Volkswagen, was one of the most effective vehicles in Germany's arsenal during World War II. 4x4 will continue in a moment. You're watching 4x4 on Modern Marvels, then and now.
After World War I, America's drive to replace the horse with a new military transportation system was moving slowly. Large trucks were fine for transportation of troops. But by the 1930s, some were lobbying for a light-duty combat vehicle that could get soldiers in and out of tight spots. It was a tough sell for a country still mired in a depression. You have to remember in those days that the budgets were minuscule. The, the, the politicians were not letting any money loose at all. So whatever development the army did, they had to do it by circumventing normal uh, modes of funding and and finding the money elsewhere and doing it themselves. Captain Robert C. Howe and Sergeant M. C. Wiley took up the challenge. Yet their belly flopper proved to be an impractical solution. The Army, however, had other ideas. And they wanted a really light scout car that would carry two or three men, that's all they wanted, maybe a light machine gun, be relatively fast, and they wanted it to be able to replace the motorcycle. Now, the motorcycle had been in use since World War I, and they found that it was very difficult to use a motorcycle cross-country. You had to be a very good rider to exact the kind of performance that was needed out of a motorcycle and not get hurt. They had a lot of injuries with motorcycles. So they developed uh, a set of specifications for a scout car. Now initially those specifications did not necessarily include four-wheel drive but they went to a company that specialized in building small vehicles, a company called the American Bantam Car Company in Butler, Pennsylvania. Bantam had been building the American version of the Austin 7, a small British roadster that was popular everywhere except in the United States. Unable to sell the car to American buyers, the company pinned its hopes on proving to the government it could build a new, lightweight combat vehicle. In the late 30s, Bantam had built a series of a few cars for the Pennsylvania National Guard using their two-wheel drive chassis. And as the military interest heightened on a vehicle for quarter ton four-wheel drive, Bantam invited the Army to come and see what they had built on the two-wheel drive chassis. They were anxious to make a government contract of some sort. So the Army sent a, a, a team of experts to Bantam to look at the factory, look at the vehicles, and see if Bantam could build something that, was, uh, that fit their specifications. So they had a sort of a two or three day engineering jam session where they discussed a whole lot of ideas. Bantam, along with the Army engineers, drew up the basic specifications for a quarter ton reconnaissance vehicle. Official plans were then drafted and a bid contract was sent out. Bantam felt they had a leg up on the competition. But the bid went out to 135 companies, including Willys Overland who had made a name for themselves in the 1920s with the Whippet and its powerful Go Devil engine. Unfortunately, Bantam's bid was not the lowest bid. Willie's Overland bid was a little bit lower than Bantam's, but Willie's was not willing to meet the 49-day schedule for a pilot model vehicle. And that's what threw the contract to Bantam. Bantam won the initial bid to produce a working prototype. If approved, they would build 70 more vehicles for further tests. While the Army was pleased with the Bantam design, the top brass had doubts about the company's ability to produce enough of the vehicles to meet the Army's demands. They did a pretty good job of building the vehicles that they were contracted to build, but to produce thousands and thousands and thousands of vehicles uh, in a short period of time, they weren't sure that uh, Bantam could do that. There was a big machine tool shortage at that time, and they gave preference to companies that had the ability to produce certain parts in-house, and uh, Willys and Ford, who later got involved in the Jeep uh, deal as well, were better able to do that. So it was purely a matter of practicality that Bantam was aced out of the Jeep business. 
Eventually, it was Willie's and their Go Devil engine that would grab the brass ring. But when the government began to manufacture the new vehicles in large numbers, Willie's had to share the glory with longtime army supplier Ford, which was better equipped to meet the government's demand. While everyone was in agreement that the new Willie's MB was a revolutionary new vehicle, no one could agree on what to call it. Names like the Beep, the Peep, the Bug, the Chigger, the Gnat, the Midget, and the Blitz Buggy were suggested. Finally, the name Jeep won out. The, the term started in World War I, and it was a term that was used for either a new human recruit or a new military vehicle that came into the motor pool that people weren't familiar with. Some believe the name came from a popular comic character, Eugene the Jeep, a magical creature who could go anywhere and do anything. So if you connect the dots, um, the term Jeep came about for both reasons. On December 7, 1941, one month after the Willys MB went into production, America declared war after Japanese bombers attacked Pearl Harbor. America quickly mobilized against the Axis. But when it was first introduced to soldiers, no one knew quite what to make of the short, squat, green convertible. It wouldn't take long, however, for the GI to embrace the Jeep as a tough, life-saving companion on the front lines. One of the Jeep's first tests came in Burma. General Stilwell's troops were trapped between the advancing Japanese army and the rain-soaked mountains leading into India. The Jeep performed above and beyond the call of duty, ferrying the troops safely to their destination. Across Europe and the Pacific, there seemed to be no task that the Jeep wasn't up to. The Jeep basically did everything during World War II. Uh, moved troops, uh, moved supplies, some of them were fitted with railroad wheels to pull train cars. Just about anything you can imagine a wheeled vehicle could do, it did. Dignitaries visiting the troops were proud to be seen in the tough little trooper. King George, Queen Elizabeth, and Franklin Roosevelt chose jeeps over more luxurious modes of transportation on their trips into the field. The cachet of the jeep could be seen back in the States when Hollywood's elite boarded a wagon train of jeeps to raise money for the war effort. While overseas, the jeep quickly became a soldier's best friend. During the war, they really came to rely on these jeeps uh, to get them out of the situations that they dreaded, to take them through the worst situations you could possibly imagine. Uh, this vehicle became their friend, uh, much akin to the uh, relationship that they may have had to their horse prior. Uh, this vehicle became their best friend out in the field, and a very dependable, life-saving instrument. By the end of the war in 1945, the Jeep was called America's greatest contribution to modern warfare. The stage was set for Willys to capitalize on the Allied victory and the Jeep's fame in the civilian marketplace. Introducing the CJ-2A, CJ for civilian Jeep, Willys highlighted the Jeep's versatility and practicality. Targeting farming and industrial customers, the Jeep CJ could be outfitted with a host of field plows, compressors, or generators. Willys Overland's original market for the Jeep was primarily as an agricultural vehicle, and their initial models were tested uh, in agricultural roles, mainly. The first civilian Jeeps were sold as utilitarian uh, farm vehicles, and uh, of course, what really happened is that the soldiers bought these, drive around, they could go you know, through the mud and over the hills and through the forest and uh, really enjoy the vehicle and it was really the birth of the off-road sport. In an attempt to introduce its vehicles to a wider market, in 1946, Willys introduced the first all-steel station wagon. Like the Jeep, it was tough, reliable and versatile, but with a seven-passenger seating capacity and two-wheel drive, it was better suited for families. In 1949, the Jeep station wagon adopted four-wheel drive, making it the family car that could not only do anything, it could also go anywhere. 
the modern sport utility vehicle was born. But it wouldn't be long before Jeep's reputation as the best 4x4 on the planet was challenged. The belly flopper, one of the first attempts at motorized transportation in the Army, could hold only two men who rode on their stomachs on a motorized platform without suspension. The highest speed this machine could achieve was 28 miles per hour. 4x4 will return in a moment. About the time that Willys was launching the Jeep CJ, the Rover Car Company of Britain was devising a utilitarian 4x4 of its own. With Jeep the only company making consumer 4x4s, the market seemed right for another vehicle which could be used by farmers. The Wilkes brothers, who ran Rover, were very familiar with the Jeep. Morris Wilkes owned a farm and had actually purchased a surplus Jeep after the war. They had great fun playing in the sand and over the dunes with this Jeep. And uh, Spencer and his brother Maurice uh, one day looked at it and said, you know, this is going to wear out, so why don't we build our own four-wheel drive vehicle? The pair put together their first prototype using an existing Jeep chassis. Wilkes gave his new vehicle the name Land Rover. The Land Rover made a big splash the company began marketing the vehicle to farmers as a replacement for the horse. The first production models rolled off the assembly line in July of 1948 at a rate of 100 Land Rovers a week. Demand for the car quickly outpaced Rover's modest production capacity. In the hands of customers throughout the world, the Land Rover proved to be the farmer's best friend. The, the initial uh, versions had power takeoffs, and you could run saws, you could pull a, a plow behind them. They used them the same as tractors, but what they liked about it is that they could throw their sheep in, take them to the market, or and bring back their supplies. So rather than have a tractor, they had a four-wheel drive vehicle that became very much an all-purpose conveyance in the uh, countryside of England. The Land Rovers were soon embraced by fire departments, the police, and the military. They also became the preferred vehicle for exploration, traversing the world's most remote regions, venturing where no vehicle had ever gone before. The vehicle was so robust and strong and simple, easy to repair in the field, that it became instantly very popular. As a matter of fact, there was, at one point in time, it was estimated that for 40% of the population of the Earth, the first vehicle they ever saw was a Land Rover. Its versatility also made it perfect for more leisurely pastimes, and a new breed of drivers soon emerged, eager to push their Land Rovers to the limit. In response, the company began sponsoring driving schools to teach owners how to properly drive their vehicles off-road. And I think if you've got an active lifestyle, if you hunt or you shoot or you sail or you tow a horse, then this vehicle will do it for you. The Land Rover became popular with parents who could take the kids on inexpensive getaways. The company soon rolled out the Series 2, which further improved the Wilkes' original design. The new station wagon had more creature comforts and was generally more user-friendly and easier to drive for women. Yet underneath was the same durable, rugged design that was Land Rover's trademark. Land Rovers traditionally have been very forgiving vehicles to drive on the trail. They, they do what they do rather effortlessly and um, un, in an understated way, and you almost are amazed at what it can do after you've done it. Throughout the 1960s, Land Rover continued to prove itself around the world. Whether they were traversing uncharted territories or serving in the armed forces, Land Rover prided itself on being able to build a vehicle for any job. In the 1960s, Land Rover offered over 150 different models. 
they were outfitted with cranes, winches, fire hoses, compressors, trailers, and plows. The British were very good at marketing the Land Rover overseas, and of course, you know, there was still all this British Empire stuff going on, and, and so all the, the countries that were maybe independent but had been British, they all bought Land Rovers in preference to Jeeps just because. Um, but in a lot of ways, the Land Rover was superior to the Jeep of the same era. It, uh, it had a much stouter chassis, a better suspension. Drivetrains were about even. The Jeep had a little bit of edge and power. But uh, the Land Rover was a good machine. Plus, it had an aluminum body, and it didn't rust. In America, however, the Land Rover was a rare sight. A few had been imported over the years, but they hadn't really made an impact on the market. The Land Rovers began to be imported to America in 1949 in very, very small numbers. Obviously, they were competing against the home team here, you know, Jeep and, and other manufacturers. So, uh, you know, their chances of achieving a major success here were pretty slim. The Jeep was still on top. But as the 1960s got underway, more Americans were discovering the joy of off-roading. To feed this insatiable hunger, a new generation of 4x4s was born that was geared for fun. The Rover Car Company of Britain, who brought us the Land Rover, was first known as the Coventry Sewing Machine Company in 1881. The first transportation vehicle built by Rover Company was a tricycle. From there, they produced safety bicycles, then motorcycles, and finally, motorized vehicles. 4x4 will continue in a moment. In the 1960s, off-road enthusiasts became more concerned with recreation than utility. After a decade trapped in the suburbs, Americans were ready to break free and escape into the wilderness. More and more of these vehicles were produced and sold. Uh, people banded together in clubs. They put together organized trail rides. The Weekend Warrior was born and groups of adventurers and families gathered together to experience the joy of outdoor living. One reason it became very popular was it was affordable. And it was a family outing type thing. You get away from your business rat race during the week, get in your four-wheel drive, pack on your camping equipment and your fishing pole, and go out and have some fun four-wheeling. To cater to this family market, International Harvester introduced a comfortable and capable 4x4, the Scout. To compete against the Scout, Ford introduced the Bronco in August of 1965. And it carried the same sport utility idea, but carried it farther than the Scout did. It was more comfortable nicer to drive on the street, more powerful, uh, with more car-like features. And that was the re resounding theme in the sport utility movement was to get the vehicles more car-like without sacrificing their ability out on the trail. Land Rover responded to this challenge with their more civilized Range Rover, which was just as much at home in the city as it was in the country. In response, Jeep introduced the Cherokee, an evolution of their popular Wagoneer series. And they were all looking for the same thing, uh, the American people. wanted a vehicle that could haul people, they could fold down or take out the rear seat and it could haul cargo, it might be able to tow, and it had to have that four-wheel drive function so that it could take them to wherever they wanted to go. With the growing popularity of four-wheeling, drivers began to test the limits of their vehicles on some of the toughest trails on the planet. People who love the four-wheel, that are into it for the driving aspect, they keep wanting to increase their challenges, so they look for more difficult terrain, which requires vehicles that are modified, and then perhaps they increase their 
skill levels and then they want to tackle more difficult terrain then they have to modify their vehicle yet again and it comes to the point where if they go that far they're driving vehicles that are total trailer queens they're not really safe or desirable to drive on the highway but they they go like no tomorrow out on the trail one of the most popular places for drivers to gather was the Baja Peninsula in Mexico Weekend get-togethers quickly evolved into wheel-to-wheel -wheel competitions to see whose machine was the fastest. It was nothing formal, and, uh, you know, we just put up some arrows around the course, and uh, it was just kind of a family-type thing, and, you know, no, there was no prize money, and I think there might have been some trophies or something like that, but other than that, it would just go uh, beat your vehicle up for uh, no basically reward. As interest in off-road racing continued to grow, drivers developed unique strategies to stay ahead of the pack. A friend of mine told me many years ago when I first started racing off-road, Ivan, you have to learn when to go fast. There are times to go fast and there are times not to go fast. Don't get the two mixed up. In a road race, for example, you continually have to go fast to stay up with, with the crowd. In off-road racing, you're racing the terrain. One of the most challenging events was the Baja 1000, which began in 1967. This rugged endurance race attracted such legendary drivers as Parnelli Jones and Ivan Stewart. This bone-jarring event snakes its way through dusty villages, over boulder-strewn trails, and along the rugged coastline of Baja, Mexico. It's exciting for the drivers, as well as their team of mechanics. If you've never done it, so there's the lure of the adventure of just coming out here and being out in the middle of nowhere and uh, just helping somebody make their uh, make their way down the peninsula. You know, it's uh, don't know any other way to describe it. It's just uh, exciting. I've heard drivers in that race call it a 12-hour adrenaline rush. Uh, it's it is incredible. There's times where you can't see clearly and you're going 75, 100 miles an hour and uh, you're, you're not sure that you're on the right path either. There's so many con uh, converging trails and tracks out there, uh, but it's very exciting, and you're, it, it is a constant test of driver and machine. In November of 2000, more than 263 entrants gathered in Ensenada for the start of the Baja 2000. Nearly twice as long as previous events, the event drew spectators from around the world who lined the dusty course from Ensenada to Cabo San Lucas to cheer on their favorite drivers. In, in any other form of racing, um, if it's a drag race or if it's Indianapolis, if it's a road circuit in Atlanta, that surface is going to be pretty much constant. We're going to run a 2,000 mile event from Ensenada to Cabo San Lucas and not one turn, not one bump, not one jump will be identical to the last one. I mean, it's the ultimate, the ultimate experience in motorsports, in my opinion. While the drivers get the lion's share of the glory, they wouldn't get far without the help of the unsung heroes of the pit crews, who risk their own safety to keep the cars going. We always had the possibility of somebody getting hurt. You got a fire probability when you're pouring fuel. You've got uh, you're jacking heavy cars up. You could you could fall off a jack. You could have somebody underneath the car at one time. We've uh, our, we stress safety immensely. We've got a guy at stop sign in the front. We've got a guy in the rear watching. Before any car is released, we uh, make sure everybody's clear. It's still very much a uh, adventure, this race especially. Uh, you think they are taking these vehicles down to Cabo San Lucas, almost 2,000 miles. Uh, it's been raining the last uh, few days, and everything that gets thrown in your way, whether it be mechanical or uh, uh, you get tired, your drivers get tired, uh, your chase crews get tired and don't show up, it's truly one of the very last motorsports adventures. While surviving the Baja is a tremendous feat, the Paris-Dakar rally is considered by many to be the most prestigious off-road race in the world. 
This rally spans over 6,000 miles in 20 days, covering some of the most inhospitable landscapes on the planet. Running flat out through the desert, without road signs or trail markers, drivers are lucky to even finish this grueling race. Those who have completed the Paris-Dakar rally, which ends at the foot of the Egyptian pyramids, know they've met the ultimate challenge and survived. Speed, however, isn't always the absolute goal of four-wheelers. Some off-roaders are more interested in testing just how high their vehicles can take them. Well, rock crawling is, you know, rather than actually built trails, um, the guys who like rock crawling will tend to try and go up or down just about anything that's out there. Uh, the vehicles they have are substantially modified to have large suspension articulation, um, so they can basically crawl their vehicles over the rocks without smashing up the bottoms or the sides. It's a little more than... I get into it. Well, rock crawling is kind of like driving places where vehicles weren't meant to go. Rock crawling basically is driving over six foot high boulders, a series of six foot high boulders through narrow uh, cracks that, that vehicles barely fit, and uh, basically doing the impossible. While these rock hoppers don't always make it to the top, there is another breed of 4x4 that can't afford to fail. The Jeep was showing its age, and the military launched a search for a rugged, go-anywhere replacement. The Humvee was about to be born. The original Whippet car got its name from the Whippet dog because the cars were small yet fast. The Willys Overland Company, who eventually paired with Ford to mass-produce Jeeps for the Army, used the Whippet as the basis of the Jeep design. 4x4 four four will return in a moment. With the 1980s and 90s came an explosion in the 4x4 four four sport utility market. In addition to such stalwarts as the Jeep and the Land Rover, new vehicles arrived from Honda, Lexus, Mercedes, Dodge, and even Cadillac. Sport utility vehicles began to really take off not so much because people wanted the recreational lifestyle, but because they wanted to differentiate themselves from the, the cars, which due to Congress computers in the wing tunnel had all become sort of androgynous clones. They all looked the same. Whereas Jeep and Land Rover had built a reputation with off-road endurance, these new vehicles were targeted at suburban drivers and came in a wide variety of sizes and configurations. With so many SUVs on city streets and suburban neighborhoods, it was only a matter of time before owners of these go-anywhere vehicles decided to put them to the test. New Jeep owners found that they could participate in jamborees, where they could discover the joy of off-roading. For Land Rover owners, club rallies a long-time tradition with international owners, are now being held for American drivers. These events, along with others, let drivers experience the full capabilities of four-wheel drive and showed them what these vehicles were originally designed to do. There's literally a group in every city of size, a club, a four-wheel drive club, off-road club. Uh, there's a lot of opportunities for someone that hasn't gone off-roading before to get involved to use the vehicle that they probably already own to uh, shuttle kids around to all the soccer team to, to games. And uh, here you can set aside a weekend every month, every other month, and go out and learn the real capabilities of the vehicle and use it off-road. Consumer 4x4s had come a long way, but for the ultimate in off-roading, the military still had the competition beat. In 1979, 
equipped with the Jeep showing its age, the Army once again set out to build a high-mobility, multi-purpose wheeled vehicle, or Humvee. It needed to be agile. It needed to be able to go places that defied imagination. And it needed to last a minimum of 12 years of the toughest treatment imaginable. The task to deliver this new vehicle was given to the AM General Corporation. And what they came up with was arguably the most versatile military vehicle in the world. The first images of these state-of-the-art vehicles came out of Panama, where they were used for everything from launching missiles to transporting the wounded. Yet the Humvee earned its real reputation in the Gulf War, where it endured some of the most punishing treatment imaginable. And like the Jeep before it, the Humvee became the soldier's best friend, as well as the envy of off-road enthusiasts around the world. Ever since we first introduced the vehicle to the military, we got queries from individuals, civilians. How can I get one of these? They, they have tremendous appeal to people on an almost magical level. Even with a starting price of over $75,000, dealers couldn't keep Hummers on the lot. There aren't a lot of people that can logically put something like that to use. If you're an outfitter or, you know, run a ranch or something like that, uh, I can see a use for it. But for somebody who wants to have a vehicle that they can drive to work and then take out on the trail, I don't think that's the one for you. Whether the Hummer is your cup of tea or not, no one can deny the impact the military has had on four-wheeling. The military really drove four-wheel drive development uh, through the early parts of the 20th century. But now four-wheel drive is a real big part of the civilian world. So the military developments and the civilian developments are really on two different tracks. Today we have a variety of choices in SUVs from traditional to upscale luxury models. The one thing they all share is that most of them will never be taken off-roading. 60% of trucks sold in the United States right now are four-wheel drive. And yet how many people really use them uh, have ever engaged four-wheel drive on these? I think the reason for that is that we like capability. We like the comfort of knowing that we can do it. Off-roading has come a long way in the last 100 years, but one thing has remained the same. These go-anywhere vehicles continue to excite and inspire us to see what lies over the next horizon. The History Channel proudly offers the program you're watching on home video for only $24.95 plus shipping and handling. To order, call 1-800-708-1776 or shop online at historychannel.com. Our president was gone. Generals were in rebellion. In 30 days, we would cease to exist as a nation. But a handshake and one man's word changed history forever. It wasn't a month. It was a miracle. April 1865, Monday at 9, only on the History Channel.